We're interested in spurring investment in new businesses, job That's, creation, right. all those kinds of things. Yeah. How do we adopt policies that are consistent with that? Yes. I guess as, a, as someone who usually yeah. looks for the smaller of the ways to do things, one, yeah. I just want to be consistent. I don't uh -huh. want to say I can accomplish that. Yeah. I just don't want to be fighting against that. Yeah. So that's one big challenge. Right. How do, what, what do you think makes sense there? Is there policy direction? You don't have to mm -hmm. give like a final answer. Do we think the policies we've been adopting are consistent with that? I guess there's a couple of different points I, I would want to make there. I mean, one, I think people have looked to monetary policy and the behavior of the short-term interest rate as uh, too much as a solution to that. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty small piece of it. I do think tax policy is interesting here in the sense of there's been so much of a focus on equity considerations of the tax, of the income distribution and wealth distribution. It's not so much that we ought, we ought to be out to punish the people that have been the big success stories, but how to help the people at, at, the, um, at the lower end of things. You don't want to structure a tax system that works against the creation of new enterprises, of new jobs, and, and the like. You have this focus on taxing the rich. Uh, one has to think, but, you know, put, put that in a way that you're not really squashing the, the, the potential there for important new enterprises, of rewarding of new ideas, re rewarding of the new adventures. I mean, do we really want to like, stop the next Bill Gates from developing something or stop the next uh, jo Steve Jobs from developing something? I mean, what can we do to encourage the development of, you know, exploration of new ideas and new enterprises and new businesses? And, and, and I would much prefer us having that conversation than, than just a more narrowly defined conversation about taxing the rich. Well, I mean, I guess as an economist, I mean, this is, I mean, maybe I'm a simplistic microeconomist, but I, I always think of, you know, one of the major things that capital investment does is push up returns to labor. Yeah. That, you know, right. I mean, in general, it's going to push down the return to capital and push up the return yeah. to labor. Maybe right. capital ends up with more money than they would have otherwise. Yeah. But that's not coming at the expense yeah. of labor. Yeah. And if I'm worried about something, it's it's the that growth yeah. that would really worry you in terms of are we encouraging the kind of investment that's happened historically? Maybe capital, new capital investment can do things that are more substitutable for labor than it used to be. Maybe that's the case. But still, at the end of the day, more capital investment yeah. should, in the end of the day, raise the returns to labor. Yeah. And then on the, on the more government fiscal side, I think if you look historically, neither Democrats or Republicans are all, all that great at kind of fiscal discipline. No. <laughs> I agree 100%. <laughs> oh, they seem to uh, um, go against it in different ways. And maybe it's the political system we're stuck with, but, uh, but this idea that we can't really think longer term about how we're going to afford things and finance projects and the like, whenever we're thinking about tax and spending policies, I would feel that that would be a very productive step forward. Yeah, I mean, it seems looking forward, it's clear we're, we're going to have to make some adjustments on taxes, spending, or both. I yeah. mean, somehow, and, and, I, and undoubtedly we will in some sense. The yeah. budget will be <laughs> in the long-term balanced. And whether that happens, uh, hopefully it doesn't happen through default, but it'll happen in some way. Right. But I think you're right. Is there's not a lot of evidence that even guys who come in and say, okay, the answer is cut spending, yeah. that hasn't really proven to be that effective at changing the fiscal balance very well. Right. Or guys who say, well, let's raise taxes. That hasn't, yeah. you know, because they often adjust the other side of the equation at the same time. Or other, other, they cut spending in one area and raise spending in another area. I mean, how do you take your Hanson four rules and apply them to tax and fiscal policy? How do we make it so that we're going to have a call it political process or a decision making process that does a better job on yeah. fiscal management? That's a tremendously challenging question. Um, so the Congressional Budget Office, as a government entity goes, is not is probably one of the higher quality ones. It's uh, but it's but it's got its hands tied in various ways that are uh, um, make it not totally reliable in terms of doing all the, you know, all these cost assessments. And there's a debate as whether you want to you know do these assessments in-house or out-of-house. You probably want to do them out-of-house. 
Could you have a rules-based approach on these? I know people have talked about, you know, so-called yeah. balanced budget amendments and yeah. things like that. The devil's got to be in the details on those things. Absolutely. What do those things even mean? Yeah. Is this one where a rules-based policy, a simple, rule, transparent, rules-based policy might make sense? Even if you could balance the budget on a period-by-period -period basis, it's not really clear that's what you want to be doing. For a variety of reasons, you, you, you might well want to be engaged in uh, balancing a budget intertemporally rather than period by period. But now take something like, you know, I know a lot of people would say, well, the sequester seemed like a dumb way to deal with things. But after the fact, a bunch of people, I think, claim it was better than the yeah. alternative of yeah. status quo. I yeah. mean, is that an example of a kind of call it rules-based approach that while far from ideal is better than the we'll deal with it however we feel like? approach that's <laughs> kind of generally operating? I think it was a step in the right direction in the sense of that it forced people to kind of face up to some things. Uh, maybe not in the best way necessarily, but... but isn't that what the Hansen scorecard pushes you toward? Maybe I'm not saying that specific policy, yeah. but it pushes you toward this view that, well, let's not try to do the absolute optimal yes. adjust to every contingency mm -hmm plan, but right. let's try to do something that, while we know it's not the best, might make sense in a lot of regimes and gets yeah. us in the right direction pretty generally. Right. I mean, I like that approach. Yeah. There's also potentially a realm of a little bit more caution that could be done to the accounting system here. I mean, so if we're going to, for government programs, if we're going to play off the intertemporal budget constraint, we're going to not be able to get firm estimates of, of all the future costs. But on the other hand, maybe some type of evaluation that put in some more conservative adjustments on things would be a sensible way to go to just make sure that, yes, we're borrowing against the future, but we're doing it in a very conservative fashion so that we're not really, really handcuffing future generations in really uh, critical ways, so we're at least guaranteed that's not going to happen. Yeah. So, 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 so kind of a conservative approach to the intertemporal budgeting, I think, could also be quite valuable here. I teach in the MBA program, and I always teach my students that, you know, when you see business plans from McKinsey or somebody, the first yeah. thing you always look at is the terminal value part, and that's where all the bodies are always buried yeah. out there. And this company's worth X because in, 20, yeah. in 10 years from now, after my cash flow estimates have terminated, I've assumed that we're going to continue to grow at 8% a year for right, right. a long period of time. You yeah. know, I guess you're, what you're saying is let's not count on things that we, again, this gets back to the uncertainty side. Yeah. Let's not count on things that we're very uncertain about yes. as you know, the keystones of our policy. Let's Absolutely. do something that makes sense over the horizon that mm -hmm. we can actually not perfectly forecast, but forecast with some degree of confidence. Right. And that has the added value, like you said, that that'll be something on which there'll be less disagreement across people at a point yes. in time, and therefore it'll achieve the goal of, yeah. of you know, making for an effectively more transparent system. If we knew how to do all the risk adjustments and that exact discounting of all the costs, then maybe we could do something bolder. But in truth, we're, we're, we're in a situation in which that's not the case, and so conservative adjustments would seem prudent. Thank you.